Hi, my name is Pam, coming to you from the Lyon Township Public Library with Getting Started with Starting Seeds, Indoor Seed Starting. For this presentation, we will be focusing on garden, vegetables, herbs, and flowers that need a head start indoors in February, March, and April in Michigan, and will be transplanted outside when the weather is appropriate. There's a lot going on in a tiny seed. Inside each seed, there is everything it needs to become a living plant. It lies dormant until you wake it up by planting it in soil, watering it, and bringing it into the light. Starting your own garden plants from seed is a huge money saver. For the same price as a six pack of plants from the nursery, you can get as many more plants from one pack of seeds. Most seeds are good for at least three or four years if stored correctly, so you might get several years of planting from one packet of seeds. If you enjoy planting early crops like broccoli and lettuce, it's almost impossible to find a nursery that is selling started plants in April in Michigan. One of the things that makes Michigan special is the weather. We enjoy all of our four seasons, sometimes in the same week. Our frost-free days can vary from 100 to 145 days in any given year. Our average last frost date in the spring usually occurs in the last couple of weeks of May. But the funny thing about averages is that half the last frosts occur before that date and half occur after. Last frost dates can be as early as late April and as late as mid-June. The same with first frosts in the fall. They can occur in early September or into November. There are no absolutes. For instance, in 2020, the first frost in the fall was on September 7th. Really early, caught us all by surprise, and we had it, those that didn't cover their crops probably lost everything because a lot of things hadn't um, completed their growing cycle by then. So if you covered your things, uh, or your plants up, then probably they kept on growing because a couple weeks after that were frost free. Michigan's last frost free date can still be too soon for warm weather crops to germinate and grow well. The soil must be warm and the night temperature moderated. Warm weather crops transplanted into cold soil could suffer a set setback and seeds sown in soil that is too cold might rot if they sit too long waiting for the soil to warm up enough for germination. This chart will help you plan on when to start seeds in our area. It is available as a handout on the library, in the library and on the LTPL Gross page at the library website, so it can be accessed anytime. Some have to be started early because the seeds germinate or grow slowly. Others because they can be put outdoors much earlier than the others. Hot peppers tend to grow more slowly than sweet peppers, so you should start them a couple of weeks earlier. Tomatoes grow more rapidly than peppers and eggplants and can be started from mid-March to early April. Be prepared to have larger plants if you start them in March because tomatoes grow rapidly. These are the supplies you will need to start seeds indoors. I'm going to go over them in more detail in the next few slides. Uh, the, the thing I am going to do with this slide is uh, talk about clean pots and trays. If you um, want to use recycled uh, the grocery packaging, that's great. A lot of things that lettuce and, and produce come in make great uh, seed starting containers. Um, you can reuse old nursery pots, some things you've bought from nurseries in the past. Um, those need to be sterilized and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, so you can, you don't have to go out and buy seed starting equipment. Most people have it in their recycle bin already or you can save them throughout the year in anticipation of seed starting in the spring. Um, one thing I get asked a lot about are dome covers. Uh, they're usually um, on a lot of the seed starting kits that you purchase, so people think that they need to use them. Um, but domes are not necessary for getting seeds to germinate. 
Some people really like them, but personally I don't use them because I'm not home enough to monitor them throughout the day. I don't recommend them for windowsill or greenhouse use because they become ovens and cook the seeds if they are hit by direct sun. The lack of ventilation can also encourage mold and other fungal diseases. If you decide to use a dome, make sure to prop it up for a few hours each day and remove it for good as soon as the seeds germinate. Most gardeners buy their sterile soil mixes pre-made, but some enjoy creating their own concoctions, usually with some combination of compost, peat, coconut coir, ground bark, vermiculite, and perlite. Seed starting mixes are more gr finely ground than regular potting mix, and they usually don't contain any fertilizers. They might contain a wetting agent to help the soil take up water easily. Large seeds like beans don't need a fine ground soil, but smaller seeds germinate and grow better if they don't have to struggle with growing through lumps and chunks. Buy what you can use in one year as old soil can get moldy or dry out and be hard to re-wet. Most seeds germinate quickly on a heat mat, even those who prefer cooler temperatures for growing on. Heat mats are waterproof and stay in a safe temperature range for starting seeds, even without a thermostat. Most of the time you can remove the heat mat after the seeds have germinated. The exception to that could be if you are growing in a very cold room or basement, you might want to leave the flat on the heat mat. Um, but you will have to pay careful attention to watering because the warm soil will dry out faster than usual. Heating pads made for people get too hot for seeds and might not be waterproof. One of the most common rookie seed starting mistakes is not providing enough light. Stocky, well-nourished seedlings are difficult to achieve on a windowsill. The days are still short and the sun is low in the sky, so supplemental light will most likely be needed even in a south window. Seedlings on a windowsill must be turned every day to try and even out growth. It is often cold next to the glass, so pay attention to that as well. LED and fluorescent fixtures work equally well for seedlings. Because the plants are only under them for a few weeks, there's no need to buy special grow light bulbs. Fluorescent bulbs need to be closer to the tops of the seedlings, within a couple of inches of the leaves. LEDs are brighter and can be four or five inches from the leaves, but keep an eye on them. If the seedlings appear to be stretching toward the light, lower the bulbs or raise the flats. LEDs are more expensive but use less energy and they last for many years. Four inch, or four foot, I'm sorry, fluorescent fixtures are inexpensive and readily available at uh, hardware stores, but burned out bulbs must be disposed of properly. Light fixtures can be hung from chains and raised and lowered as needed or affixed to racks. Uh, most of the time we we recommend that you do uh, have 12 to 16 hours of light for your seedlings and uh, that a timer really helps with that if you have a timer on your lights and you don't have to keep watching the clock to make sure that uh, your lights are turned on and off in time. Air circulation is very important to the health of the seedlings. In nature, seedlings are subjected to breezes and it helps them create a strong stem. We can mimic the breeze by using fans. A small clip-on or whisper fan is adequate for a couple of flats, and a larger fan is good for moving air in a room with several flats. It should not be pointed directly at the plants. Air circulation also helps prevent mold and other fungal diseases. Luckily, most of the seeds we start indoors in February through March do not need any special treatment at all. A few, like parsley, benefit from soaking in a moist paper towel overnight, prior to planting, and sometimes this helps increase the germination for older seeds of any type. You can use the same method to do a germination test to test the viability of your seed. Simply leave a test amount of seeds, 10 or so, in the moist paper towel until they germinate. Counting the seeds that germinate will give you an idea how many seeds you will have to start to get your desired amount of seedlings. Scarification and stratification are techniques usually used for seeds of perennials, which are started in the fall or winter. And pre-soaking and pre-sprouting can be used from some larger seed, seeds with hard seed coats when direct sowing, like beans and okra. 
Seeds come in all sizes and shapes. Very fine seeds should be pressed into the soil and covered lightly, if at all. These tiny seeds often need light to germinate, so check on that before planting. Seeds that are long and slender should be planted on their sides, like marigold seeds, two or three times the depth of their narrowest point. Large seeds, like peas and beans, are planted at one half to one inch deep. Now that you've figured out the mechanicals and gathered your supplies, it's time to start those seeds. If you are using pots previously used for plants of any kind, make sure they have been washed and disinfected. New pots and recycled food containers need to be washed and clean. Drying pots in the sun always adds an extra layer of disinfection, but that isn't always possible in the winter time. Fresh, newly opened, high-quality potting soil is often quite moist and will wet easily because the manufacturer often uses a wetting agent. If the soil is dry, it can actually repel water and might have to be wet and stirred several times and allowed to sit overnight before it is moist enough to use. If you skip this step and the soil is too dry when you plant your seeds, the soil may never get moist enough to support life. When filling your pots or flats, gently tamp down the soil and add more until it comes to just below the rim of the pot. Um, you want to make sure you eliminate any air pockets that could cause tender roots to dry out. Well-packed pots also produce a better transplant that is held together with strong roots. There's more one, than one way to start your seeds. Um, in the next few slides, we'll cover the three most common methods. The most straightforward method with the fewest steps is to plant seeds directly into the pots they will grow in until time comes to transplant. Choose pots or cells that are deeper than they are wide. Make a slight indentation in the surface with, and sow two to three seeds. Try to slightly space the seeds so it will be easier to remove, remove the extra seedlings if they all germinate. It's best to cut the extras out with small scissors or clippers at soil level before they crowd each other. Pulling the extras could damage the newly formed roots, so clipping in, is definitely the better way to go. Always be prepared for the possibility that the seedlings might grow faster than you think and might need to be transplanted into larger pots before it is safe to plant them outdoors. This is especially common with tomatoes because they grow rapidly. Broadcast seeding is used with very fine seeds that will be plucked out and transplanted into individual cells when they get their second set of new leaves. This method works well with fine seeds like celery, celeriac, and parsley. It also works for members of the allium family, onions, leeks, scallions, and saps, shallots. As long as they aren't sown too thickly, you can stay in, they can stay in this container until April when they can be planted outdoors. For the alliums, large spring mix containers with three inches of soil are perfect. Just make sure there are several holes drilled, drilled in the bottom of, for drainage. Give the onions a trim when they get to be about four inches tall and keep the energy going into the bulbs and roots. At planting time, carefully tease the roots apart and plant. The last method is to plant seeds in rows two inches apart in large flats. It is the best method to use when you only have one or two heat mats and need to start a lot of seeds at once. I am partial to kitty litter pans for this method because they are deep and expensive and hold up to years of use. Several holes will need to be drilled for drainage. Transplant seedlings into cells or pots when they get their second set of leaves. Because the seedlings will be temporarily in close quarters, it's best to plant like with like so they grow at the same pace. Plant brassicas with brassicas, and brassicas are um, cabbages, broccoli, uh, cauliflower, things like that. Um, tomatoes with tomatoes and greens with greens. As with all methods, make sure you label each seed and water very carefully to avoid the seeds moving around in the flat. Once the seeds become rooted, they stay put pretty well, but then they must be watered as gently as, until then they must be watered as gently as possible. The soil should be kept evenly moist, but not soggy. 
a spray bottle is good. It's set on the uh, on the spray function and not the stream. Um, you can also use bottle bottom watering where you set the tray of seeds or seedlings into a larger tray filled with water. Um, that way the water is soaked up from underneath and is a more gentle way of watering the plants. Um, the watering can, the larger ones tend to be pretty forceful, so you would want to wait to use that until your seeds are well rooted. Um, there's also methods where you can use a mat, a, a wicking mat, that is uh, that one end of it is, sits in a reservoir of water and the rest of it is underneath the flat of plants. Uh, that's um, certainly a, a good way to go if you have that equipment, but you can get by with those, nothing very fancy. Okay, germination has begun. The moment you have been waiting for has arrived. The first set of leaves that emerge are cotyledon leaves. These are the leaves that were inside the seed and they contain stored energy. They are soon followed by the first set of true leaves. These leaves, true leaves, begin to nourish the seedling and they more closely resemble the actual leaves of the grown plant. The second set of true leaves signals it's time to transplant from the seed tray into their own cells or pots, if they weren't sown into their own pots from the start. If you wait longer than that, the roots become more entwined and the stems grow too tall and spindly. Transplanted seedlings require a gentle touch. Using a wide utensil like a butter knife, lift the seedlings out of the container and onto the newspaper. Working quickly so the roots don't dry out, carefully tease them apart and create a hole in the soil of your planting pot with a pencil or your finger. Pick up the seedlings using the leaves. Uh, this is important because if the leaf gets damaged, it's more easily replaced by the plant, but bending or squeezing the stem could ruin the seedling. Holding the seedling by the leaves, set the roots of the seedling um, so that the roots fall into the hole. Press the soil back together gently and water in the seedling. Be mindful when transplanting that you continue to keep like with like so faster growing seedlings like greens or tomatoes do not overshadow slower growing types. Squash, melons, cucumbers, corn, beans, sunflowers, and okra do far better sown directly into the garden when the soil has warmed. When planted outdoors, these seeds germinate and grow rapidly, often outgrowing their pots within days. Our short summers in Michigan, though, sometimes make it necessary to start certain long season varieties indoors to buy two or three weeks of growing time. All of these plants are prone to transplant shock, so it is best to use pots that can be directly planted into the soil with the plant. The pots break down quickly in the soil and the roots grow right through them. Plant at least two seeds per pot and make sure the pots are fairly large, especially for squash and melons. Cut out the weaker of the seedlings and leaving one strong one and plant in the ground as soon as possible. For your short term seedling pots, the most common options are peat pots, paper pots, soil blocks, and compressed peat pellets. Peat pellets resemble a small hockey puck and expand when soaked in water. They are on the small side, so useful for smaller plants. The equipment to make soil blocks is a bit pricey, so not for the beginner on a budget. Peat pots are widely available to purchase, and since they have a tendency to mold in long-term use, this is the best way to use them. Last of all, you can make pots from newspaper. It's free and they work. You can make them any size you need by wrapping a couple of layers of paper around a straight-sided cylinder like a jar or a can, then folding over the bottom and securing it with a bit of masking tape. It's kind of like uh, coin envelopes where you put the, you kind of stuff them in one end and, and, pour, and fold over the end and a little bit of masking tape will also help keep it together and it usually breaks down pretty easily in the soil as opposed to plastic tape. For fertilizing seedlings that have gotten more than two sets of leaves, you want to use a diluted fertilizer. Liquid organic fertilizers like fish emulsion or kelp extract have a lot of trace min minerals and elements and support steady even growth. Use them at half strength. 
If you prefer a synthetic fertilizer, use it at one quarter strength. You can apply liquid fertilizers to the soil or spray them on the leaves. When it is time to transplant the seedlings in the garden, you can mix compost or other soil amendments or fertilizers into the soil. Organic gardeners should stick with compost and fish or kelp emulsion. Okay, we're going to talk about um, our problems that could crop up. Um, one of those problems in the, in, that's kind of in the middle uh, right picture is called damping off. This is caused by pathogens. Um, the best thing to do is sterilize and start over. Um, once, they, once they're infected, you don't want, they're never going to be right. So you just throw them out, restart. You probably have time. Uh, mold can be caused by contaminated soil. Um, it can be caused by contaminated um, uh, you know, equipment like your pots, or it can just be um, spores that are in the wind, depending on what you know, where what's around your uh, plants. Uh, the best thing to do with mold is remove it and correct the issues, which is usually ventilation and or light. Um, the easiest way to remove it is to take a, a Q-tip uh, and kind of just roll it around, picking up the mold off of the flat. Um, if the mold has overcome everything and is, is, you know, again, better just to throw away the dirt, start with fresh dirt and sterilized pots. Um, algae slime sometimes happens when there's too much water and bright light which is a good thing, the bright light part. Um, but sometimes when there's no, the small plants don't create a leaf canopy to kind of shade the soil. Um, again, like the mold, if the algae is not bad enough, you can scrape off it off the top and kind of correct the conditions. Um, sometimes it happens when you've got slow growing plants that um, are growing at a slower pace than some other plants in the same flat. So they're getting watered at the same rate as the other plants that have larger roots and are taking water up more rapidly. But yet they, they're kind of sitting in a little puddle of uh, soggy soil. So um, removing those, you know, removing it from there and maybe putting it in a different area so that it's not getting watered so much, um, that, that usually algae is not a fatal. Uh, problem, unless of course it has completely taken everything over, then you just throw it away, throw away the soil, and start again. Uh, in the bottom right hand corner, we have leggy seedlings. This is caused when too many seeds are planted and they're not thin soon enough, so that you, you know they, sh they should be thin to just one plant per packet. And sometimes people don't do that. It's really hard to thin seeds. It's kind of emotional, you know, you're, oh my gosh, I'm killing all these babies. But it's necessary um, in order to avoid problems like this. Um, another problem that can cause this is when, um, even if they're thin, some seedlings, if they're not getting enough light, are going to grow and stretch, trying to get more light. And that spindly stem is never going to create a good plant. So when this situation is in this picture happens, you're better off just tossing and starting over. Uh, fungus gnats are um, something that a lot of people, they can't figure out where they came from and they may uh, blame the potting soil that they bought thinking that they had eggs in it or something. But Chances are fungus gnats kind of are one of those things that's always in our environment, especially if you have house plants. Um, they're, they respond to moist soil, so sometimes they'll be kind of dormant and you might not even notice the occasional tiny little gnat in your house. But when you start seeds and you've got this nice flat of moist soil, um, that's a perfect condition and just it doesn't take long for just one or two gnats to uh, kind of set up housekeeping in your, in your flats. So what happens is they lay their eggs in the soil and it's not the gnats themselves that actually harm the plants, it's their larvae which um, feed on fungus in the soil um, and, and again all these things, fungus and bacteria and things are always in our, our um, 
atmosphere around us, but it's just when it's something opportunistic, like a fungus gnat larva comes along, they feed on this fungus and they feed on the plant's roots and um, that's where they become a problem. So one of the best ways to get rid of fungus gnats is yellow sticky traps. You can buy those online or in most garden centers. Um, you set them up and they will attract uh, fungus gnats and probably an assortment of other little um, creatures too that like uh, flies, house flies and things, little moths. And um, so when, if this, they're attracted to the sticky traps, then they cannot, you know, they get stuck to them and they can no longer reproduce. Um, it's not a bad idea, even before you have a problem, to invest in a package of sticky traps. You just have one, one or two hanging up in your seed starting area near the plants. And that way, you know, it kind of nips the problem in the bud before it ever stops. Um, if, if the fungus gnats have set up housekeeping in your soil, um, some people feel that cinnamon sprinkled on the soil could uh, possibly repel the adults from uh, going to the soil. Um, another thing that some people use is uh, like parakeet grit, uh, the, you know, putting a, maybe a eighth of an inch layer of parakeet grit on the soil. Problem with that is um, your seedlings are going to be in your home for just a short period of time. The, the parakeet grit thing works a little bit better with houseplants and things that are more a little long term. Um, but just, you know, helping keep your plants moist but not soggy is always a good thing because that's what attracts them. Um, but definitely the yellow sticky traps are the way to go for um, your fungus gnat issues. Uh, critter control, um, mice are the probably one of the big threats for critters in the house. Um, they love to munch on little specially sprouted seeds because they like you know, everybody else has been they've been starved for fresh vegetables from the garden all, all winter long. So they, they are very much attracted to seeds um, that are pl uh, flats of seed, germinated seedlings. Um, now, the easiest way to keep them out is to create a barrier. Um, in the lower left corner, I've got a picture of a seed starting tray with um, a hardware cloth cover that's been that is bent on the sides so it fits right over there. Um, it's not a hundred percent mouse proof, but it it's pretty uh, pretty good at keeping them out. Um, some people say um, that they like to use peppermint oil or castor oil. Um, I wouldn't use it right in the flats with the plants, but you can put it in um, like soak a paper towel with it and lay it around the flats so that it, the smell the you know repels them. Um, I use castor oil a lot outside in my around my raised beds and I know a lot of people swear by peppermint too so that's one thing you can try. I, I have more faith in the barrier uh, of the wire cage than I do in the oils though. Um, some people say well my cat um, likes to catch the mice and, and that that's you know, obviously a good solution uh, if the cat uh, is cooperative with that. But, you know, one thing that cats are attracted to are nice flat areas with, with heat. And so if you've got your seedlings on a heat mat, cats often like to, you know, find them and lay on them and roll around on them. And so, you know, that may or may not be a great idea to have let your cat have access to your seedling area. Of course, there's, uh, there's also the, the ultrasonic repellents that make a little bit of a noise. Um, you have, if you have other pets and things in the home, you might want to read up and make sure that this won't bother them. It's made for rodents or bugs, but you know, it cannot bother other pets in the house, possibly. So do your research before you buy a ultrasonic repeller. And finally, there's traps. Um, the you know I, that's the saddest way I guess to take care of the problem. But sometimes um, most a lot of people feel it's necessary, and they have no problem trapping mice. You can also live trap the mice. They do make little live traps for that and release them outside. But 
they got in somehow the first time, they'll probably find their way back in again. Um, um, I just, the, the worst possible thing that, that I can think of is the sticky traps. They're really unnecessarily cruel ways of um, getting rid of, rid of rodents. Um, they take a long time to die, and it's a just a horrible ending. So I always plead with people not to use that method. Um, use a fast-killing trap if you feel you must. Okay, transplanting outdoors. Um, before you set your tender little seedlings outdoors, you want to go through a process called hardening off. Um, putting your seedlings, planting them right from the greenhouse or the light under the lights and putting them directly into the ground is like you taking a um, vacation to Florida in the middle of winter and sitting outside all day with you know, in your swimsuit, you know, you know what's going to happen. Your skin's going to burn, and the same thing will happen to plants. If they don't turn red, but they will, they, the the skin, the leaves will actually um, look fried at sometimes. It's in, in a combination of wind and sun is just too much for them. Because even on a mild day, we usually have some sort of a breeze, and uh, which is probably more equivalent to what you if you put the ventilation fans on your plants. They probably get, used to a little bit of breeze, but they're not used to the occasional gusts that they're going to get outside. So um, the first thing you want to do is start them um, in the, um, you know, set them out in a place that's that's protected. Maybe, you know, like I, I, I put mine sometimes on the stairs of my house so that the, you know, the sides of the stairs kind of protect them a little bit. You want to protect them from both sun and wind. Um, put them, so put them in partial shade or in a spot where they might get sun for two or three hours and then the rest of the time they're in the shade. Um, you know, it's usually fairly easy to find some place in your yard like that. Um, and then every day you increase the amount of time they spend outdoors, gradually getting them, moving them into more sun every day um, and getting them used to a little bit more breeze. And so after a week, week and a half of that type of treatment, they're usually okay to plant outside at that point. Make sure you don't forget to water your plants. They dry off a lot faster when they're sitting outside. So you may have to water them two or three times a day, depending on the conditions. Um, you can uh, definitely, when it's time to plant them in the ground, add some compost or, to the soil uh, or some type of fertilizer. Again, stay, you know, dilute your fertilizer. You don't want to give something too strong to them until their root systems have kind of adjusted to being outdoors and gotten a little, um, little larger and more able to support the plant. So again, kind of compost or kind of fertilize them with liquid fertilizer the same way you have been indoors. Um, now the time to plant trans, transplant seedlings outdoor in Michigan is um, depends on what you've got. Hardy plants like cabbages, broccolis, greens, lettuce, kale, onions, leeks, pansies, and violas are, are extremely hardy. They can go into the garden um, usually mid-April through early May. Um, Mid-May, you can put out Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, celery, parsley, alyssum, nicotiana, petunias, and snapdragons. Um, now, with these two, of course, the, the first group, the mid-April group, um, is entirely dependent on the weather. Uh, if, if you can look out, look at the... Uh, long-range forecast and say, well, you know, I'd like to plant, it's 45, 50 degrees today, I can plant these things outside, but if if it's going to go down to 15, you know, next week, the next week, um, you might want to just hold off. Um, you've got a little bit of leeway there, um, so just keep an eye on the weather. All of the things in the first group can take a mild frost, but that doesn't mean it's going to do them any good. So if you, you can also um, cover them with remay or something like that, and I'll go over that in another slot in the next slide. So, but yeah, just kind of keep keep kind of be intuitive about things. Keep watch the weather, and uh, it has 
we have definitely had some bitter cold weather in April. So, you know, you while they may survive, just you can also hold off planting them if it looks like it's on the way. Uh, but by mid-May, you're, you're usually pretty safe to put everything out. Um, one reason I say Brussels sprouts and cauliflower a little later is that Brussels sprouts will often uh, mature too soon. Um, you want your Brussels sprouts to mature right about the time of your first frost because it actually sweetens them. Uh, so if you plant them too early, the sprouts get too big and then they start to kind of, uh, I call it, you know, they just kind of blow open, you know, and become very loose. So you want your, your Brussels sprouts to be primed if they're hard little nuggets right at, right at the time of frost. So if you plant them too early, that, that might throw your uh, planting off. So transplant them closer to mid-late May. Uh, cauliflower is not quite as hardy as cabbage and broccoli and some of the other um, greens. So in, in if it's given really cold temperatures when it's very young, it can affect its ability to form a head. So again, I kind of say, you know, with Brussels sprouts and cauliflower, I kind of push those back. Um, celery, parsley, uh, I put out earlier than mid-May, again, watching the forecast. They, they, they do enjoy cool weather. And the problem with um, Michigan is you can go from freezing to way too hot you know, in the, the span of two or three days. And so suddenly, you know, it's like not warm enough to plant your plants and then all of a sudden it's too warm. So you, you just kind of have to do the best you can with, and that's why I kind of give a guideline here of when, when is the best time to put these out. Um, now your warm loving plants, like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, basil, basil um, an assortment of other flowers, uh, they all, really need it to be good and warm when you plant them out. So um, again, we uh, we many times have had frost since the first week of June. So I always say, yeah, if you, if you, when you put them out late May or early June, um, be prepared to cover them if the, if we do get a frost or if, even if it gets cold, because it doesn't have to get down to 32 degrees to damage the plants. A lot of these warm loving plants can be damaged even in the 40s. So you want to make sure you wait long enough so that the chance of that happening is pretty low. Um, when planting your plants, check seed packets, books, or internet sources to find out how far apart to space them. Um, and then almost, you know, most most garden plants require full sun. A few things like greens and, and some of the brassicas can take up you know, a partial shade, but they still need a good six hours of sun a day to produce. And they're going to produce better in full sun. But yeah, everything has its own requirements. So kind of look up um, your particular plants and see how to, how to space them, etc. Uh, some of the frost protection um, that is, you know, available for use is um, up in the upper right-hand corner. We have cloches. Um, the fancy green ones and glass ones are really nice, but they become ovens like in, in the sun. So you can you have to get out in the morning before the sun gets really strong and pull them off of the plants. Um, you, you're actually a little safer to cut the bottom out of a plastic jug. You know, this is milk jugs, vinegar jugs, whatever. And um, that way you've got a top that you can leave open um, that gives some protection, but if you don't get out there right away, you've got a little bit of ventilation. It doesn't become so much of an oven. So actually, the the, the other cloches are, are great for decorate, decorative purposes, but you're almost better off using a, a free, uh, free uh, plastic jug for making a cloche over your plants. Um, in the bottom left, we have a cold frame. Uh, that's a, the one that's shown is pretty ham, pretty fancy. It's got a pulley system to open and close the doors. Um, but a cold frame can be as simple as some hay bales or you know big pieces of wood with with a um, you know a window, old window over the top or some plastic 
stretch, clear plastic stretched on a frame um, that just sitting on the top of something, you know, just something to protect them, give them that extra layer of protection. Um, the thing you have to be careful with is is like the cloches. If you if you leave the uh, cold frame closed and the sun comes out, it's going to get very hot in there very rapidly. Um, they do make these little uh, hydraulic lifts that, that, that will open and close your, um, they, they sense the temperature and open and close your cold, cold frame automatically. That's really nice for people who work. Um, and the, because if they're not home to open and close it, then you know, you know it's being taken care of. Um, cold frames are awesome and you can even use your cold frames to harden off your seedlings because you can put them out there, um, close up the cold frame, you know, it, it, in, and leave the seedlings out, you know, for the cold hardy ones. Um, so it's a great, it's a great tool to have if you've got the room and the wherewithal to have a cold frame. They're a really great garden tool. Um, on the lower right, we have, that's called spun bonded or floating row cover. Um, it goes by several trade names. One of them is Remay. Um, but they, they are, it's a very light fabric that kind of, you can lay it right on the plants. You don't have, you can put, also put it over little hoops too to keep it off the plants, but um, it's made to lay right on top of the plants. Um, you can actually plant your seedlings out, put the remay over them, and leave it there for a few weeks because in, in, in addition to helping with uh, temperature extremes, it also keeps uh, the flies from that the lay eggs in the soil and cause root maggots and um, allium maggots and uh, that's the other one I'm thinking of. But, you know, it, it, it keeps the... Oh, uh, leaf miners also often are a problem with uh, spinach and beets. <clears throat> so, you know, you can, and, and it's breathable, so you don't have to worry about taking it off when the sun comes out. And um, it also provides a slight bit of, you can get it in various degrees of shade. You can get 50% or 80%, uh, uh, you know, the, let's say 80% of the sun through or 90% of the sun through or 50% of the sun through. You know, if you're growing shade-loving plants, you would want to use the uh, ones that, that block more sun. But for most of your vegetable plants, you're just trying to moderate the temperature and maybe give them a little sun uh, a break from the sun while they're little, um, so you would probably want the the higher amount of sun coming through. Succession sowing is when you uh, plant the same crop over and over throughout the season. Um, it's great for greens uh, like spinach and lettuce and things, chards, kales, because um, you can and you can start all of those inside. Um, and then when you plant them, transplant them outdoors, you go ahead and plant them again into the soil. So once the first planting is eaten up, then you, your second planting is coming along, and so on and so on. Um, you can also use that uh, for beets and carrots. Uh, they're, they're both plants that you can succession sow throughout the, until about the middle of summer, and so that they have time to uh, mature before uh, the first frost comes. Uh, but yeah, you can have uh, you you can just uh, have subsequent crops of a lot of plate things that grow rapidly. Um, you can do it with um, in the fall. You can do it with radishes and things like that. Most of your cool season crops, like radishes, in the spring, you kind of get one crop and then it gets hot and they're done for. But planting them in late summer to mature in the fall. Um, you can sometimes get several crops out of those. So that's succession sowing. It's, it's, it's a, kind of a fun thing to do to keep your supply going. Um, there's a lot of people say, well, where do I get seeds? Um, well, you can, if you go into any hardware stores or um, most department stores right now, you know, they've got some sort of seed rack out. Um, some, some have many different brands depending on where you go. Uh, seed catalogs are great. Once you, or, there, everybody has their seed catalog online, but you can also, uh, write, you know, email them and ask them to send you a paper catalog if they have them. Um, some companies have gone 
to not having paper catalogs anymore. So, but most everything is available online now. Um, seed libraries, uh, our Lyon Township Public Library has a seed library, um, and, the, and there's about uh, over 100 in the state of Michigan. So if you don't live right here in our corner of the world, if you're watching this from somewhere else, um, check out your lo local libraries, check out the Michigan Library uh, Seed Network website. They have a map of all the site seed libraries in Michigan. Um, you can also go to seed swaps and trades. Uh, over the pandemic, the seed swaps kind of slowed to nothing, but there's some of them are starting back up again. So just kind of, um, if you subscribe to our newsletter, uh, at LTPL Grows newsletter through the library, um, I usually put in when there's going to be seed swaps in the area. Um, and and, I, and I, I also do the geographic area because some of them, uh, you know, are as far away as Indianapolis and those. But it's, it's, if you're really into seeds, it's a fun trip to make. Um, you can save your own seeds or, you know, the, that's where some of the seed library plants come from, or seeds come from. Um, so learning how to save seeds, we generally do a product, uh, program every year here at the library on seed saving. And you can gather from the wild, especially uh, our Michigan native plants. If you become familiar with what our native plants are, you can go out and find them and save seeds from them in the fall and um, plant them for use in your own garden. Okay, a little more about our seed library um, and how it works. The seeds are free. Um, they come from donations. They come from... Uh, People, you know, seed companies that will sometimes send us their year-old seeds from the year before. Um, and they also come from, the. sometimes the library buys seeds to fill in with some that, that haven't been donated. Uh, depends on the seed library. Um, with our seed library, it's a one-time registration. Um, when you register for the seed library, you, you are on our email list and we'll get our newsletter automatically. Um, and after you've registered one time, whenever you take seeds, you just have to mark on the clipboard on top of the seed library um, how many you've taken and your initials and the date. Um, and we ask that you please attempt to save seeds to donate back to the seed library to help it be self-sustaining. Um, at the seed library, we also have handouts, most and, and they're on the side in the rack. Uh, most of the handouts, including the what to start when that we saw earlier in this program, are there. Um, you can also find those handouts on our LTPL website. If you go to, you can just Google LTPL and or Lyon Township Public Library, and then when you get to that website, you scroll down and you'll see a link to the LTPL Grows which um, has information about our community garden, about our demonstration garden, about our upcoming programs, our handouts, links to um, um, really vetted um, seed starting and seed saving um, websites. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a lot there and you know, please take a look and, and see what you find. And, then, and again, links to many of the handouts that we have are also um, on that website. You just click on it and you, can have, you don't even have to come in and get them. You can just view them from your home. Okay, uh, Seed Savers Exchange has excellent resource pages. Um, seedsavers.org slash learn. And, you know, uh, there's so much information there. Mother Earth News also has an excellent gardening um, section. Um, you know, again, if you don't have, you don't have to have this link. You can just get Google Mother Earth News and organic gardening and all of these uh, just oodles of information. Uh, both of these are very reliable sites, not necessarily Michigan sites, but they, you know, they definitely. Um, are, are, are good and reliable. And then there's also the Michigan Gardener or migardener.com. Um, he has a lot of videos and information on his site that would probably be more Michigan centric. And of course, Lyon Township Library, as I mentioned before, we've got sources, you know, links to sources for seeds, program handouts, 
and garden and all these gardening links are on that as well. So I hope you enjoyed this program. I tried to put as much um, information as possible. So um, if you have any questions, you can um, stop in at the library. You can um, email me at pquackenbush at ltpl.org. Or you can um, stop by and ask me to put you on the email list if you aren't already. And then you will get our newsletter Every, at the beginning of every month, and the newsletter has information about upcoming programs, uh, new gardening books that we have in the library. We have an herb of the month now that um, you, it's a kit you can pick up um, having to do with the herb, and it, it'll have maybe a sample of the herb, maybe some tea, maybe some seeds. It depends on the herb and the month. Um, and uh, Again, all of our upcoming programs are just really important. So please, um, when you get that newsletter, crack it open and take a look. And um, you can always um, go to our website, the ltpl.org website, and you can sign up for the newsletter if you aren't always get, already getting it. But thank you very much, and um, I'll hope to see you soon.